Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before the Lord, let us stand and affirm the promise that relates to the door of our hope. Let the resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your name for the great privilege of being in this place that your hand has appointed for the worshiping of your holy name. And now allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted up to heights that are not reachable for us and destroy all burden and sin that binds us. May in the service, as previously, all the works of the devil be cursed, illnesses, poverty, untimely death, demonic possessions, all matter of fear, depression, destruction, ignorance, error, all of these things, may they depart from the tents of your holy people. And now stand, O Lord, upon the place of your rest, you and the ark of your might, and may your saints be clothed into your salvation and rejoice before your face. Give us more of your Spirit, saturate us with your Holy Spirit, allow us to find your great face. We thank you that the service is presented by Apostle Arkady into your godly hands, and we pray, continue to lead it with a powerful and mighty arm, our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May you be blessed. Please be seated. The book of Ephesians 4.22-24 You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful lusts, to be made new by the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self created by God into righteousness and holiness. And this place of scripture, my pastor has given the next theme. The right to the power to put off our former way of life so that we can clothe our bodies into a new way of life. To fulfill this decree and commandment written in the book of Apostle Paul and presented to us in the series of sermons of Apostle Arkady, we need to put three destiny impacting, commanding, and fundamental acts into practice. These are put off, be renewed, and put on. And as we have noted, this is something that only apostles can present. Apostle Paul, Apostle Arkady, others are not able to give these destiny impacting, commanding, and fundam fundamental acts to present them and explain them. This is for those who have the authority of a father from God. Fulfilling these three requirements will determine whether our salvation happens that is given to us in the format of a seed which we need to obtain as a possession in the format of the fruit of righteousness. Relevant to this, we speak here of the three verbs, very familiar to us verbs, and frequently stated, and these three verbs, they are at the foundation of our salvation, and our salvation absolutely depends upon these three verbs, our ability to put off, renew, and put on the new man. And these three requirements, they, they are mutually linked. You can't just fulfill one. You can't clothe yourself, for example, or put on the new clothing if you first put off the old man. You need to put off the old man first it, to put on the clean and bright linen is only possible if you put off the old man but anyone who does not want to put off the old man but wants to put on the 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 fine and bright linen will not be able to do this that when a person decides i don't want to put off our my former way of life i don't want to renew my mind but i do want to put on the new death will be swallowed up by victory if we first put off the old man and then we renew our mind with the spirit of our mind and then we can put on immortality there's a specific order in the way you can clothe yourself into this immortality and so if this does not happen if we don't put off and if we try to put on this promise 
than the scriptures say, we being clothed will end up naked. And it's not just in the situation that a person ends up naked. Sometimes a person has truly put off something, has renewed something and dedicates himself to God, but he's putting on garments And so, there's a story, a little anecdotal story, that there was a king and he had two helpers, and the helpers found a, a beautiful gown or garment for him, and this king hired them that they prepare him a gown as they, a robe in the way that uh, that they had offered him, offered him. And so the king arrives, the king has undressed, they put on this unseen garment on him, they're in awe of it, the king is confused looking around and not understanding what's going on. And they're just standing in awe and fascinated, how wonderful, what kind of knits, until Someone from the crowd, a little boy, shouted out, The king is naked. Why does this happen? When a person wants to undress, but allows that just anyone dress them, this person is still naked. And so, for this not to happen to us, why we note that these required commandments, they're written in the book of Apostle Paul and presented in a series of sermons of, of, of Apostle Arkady, we, we're not just showing who the author of this is, but the authorship of it, but how we can put on righteousness, fine and bright linen. The scriptures say the, 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 <clears throat> the feast is ready for the bride, and she was given fine and bright linen to put on. This is the... she was able to put on, she was able to be clothed into this linen. She did not take the linen, she prepared herself as she was required to us to then put on this fine and bright linen. This garment is given to you in the church that has the status of a narrow gate. Only there can we receive this uh, bright, clean and bright linen. And so relevant to this, we stopped to study the allegory contained in the 18th Psalm of David, where getting to know and confessing the power that is contained in the heart of David, consisted of the eight names of God, allowed David to love and call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and gave God the legitimate ability to use the power contained in the capabilities of his names to battle against the enemies of David. And here is Psalm 18, 1 through 3. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I have been saved from my enemies. And so let us together proclaim these eight names of God, the confessions of our heart. Lord, you are my strength. Lord, you are my rock. Lord, you are my fortress. Lord, you are my deliverer. Lord, you are my rock in whom I take refuge. Lord, you are my shield. Lord, you are the horn of my salvation. And Lord, you are my stronghold. May the Lord hear these confessions. May he make us worthy of these names. And may he confirm them within our heart and our mind and our body. the power of his resurrection. And so we've noted, we've studied the name of God's strength and the second name, Rock. And right now we're studying the name of God, Fortress, the third name. And so magnifying the word of God within our heart, we clothe ourselves into the power of the name of God's strength. And after this, we weigh ourselves upon the scale plates of righteousness 
and cleanse ourselves from all filth of the flesh and spirit with the abilities contained in the lot of the name of God rock to then receive the right in Jesus Christ to access uh, that is in the lot contained in God's name fortress so the lot of the name of God fortress so that we can then approach God the name of God fortress used in the given prayer psalm is a component of the inherited lot of the Son of God in whom and by whom a person can approach God so that he can know God and be fertilized with the seeds of the kingdom of heaven containing the oath promises of God in Hebrew the name of God fortress is identified as God's habitation God's house God's sanctuary unapproachable light in which God dwells the place where man gets to know God the opportunity to be fertilized with the seeds of the kingdom of heaven the atmosphere of the success of God and joy of God the hope of God and the trust of God and so these eight definitions they reveal to us who God is as our fortress practically the fortress of God is a specific place where God abides within the boundaries of which we can know God and be fertilized with the seeds of the kingdom of heaven a very rich uh, list of definitions formed very well by our pastor and as for, he says that the fortress of God is a place where God abides it's a specific place within, within the boundaries of which we can know him and be fertilized with the seeds of the kingdom of heaven this is the place where God abides and this is the place where we know him <clears throat> And so some people say, well, what's the difference what church we go to? There is a big difference. For, for example, there are people who aren't other countries. They call and they ask, we don't know what church to go we, to. go to. We see you, we watch you on, te- on the television, but we don't have you here in our country. What do we do? And Pastor Arkady says, you need to find a good healthy church there where they sing psalms not rock music but from the book of songs there where they desirably where they read the bible and where they break bread and they receive it as his body and they drink the cup the blood of jesus christ find this church is it possible that in your country you don't have any churches like this attend that church and continue to watch also on the television the sermons uh, on the television on the internet and when you take the bread you thank God but be a member of a specific body you can't just sit at home you absolutely need to be a member of a specific church and then the Lord will <clears throat> take care of <clears throat> and ensure that things uh, work the way they should And so if you you receive these kinds of questions, uh, this is the kind this is the response. this is the answer. God has delivered us from all the nations, tribes, peoples. And so how is it that in Germany or Mexico or, or Russia or anywhere else that there isn't a church uh, that they s- sing uh, the hymns, the book of hymns, songs from the book of hymns, <clears throat> they break bread, they focus on the word or at least read the Bible. <clears throat> and this place where God abides and the place where we get, can get to know God <clears throat> this place is situated in three unique realms these are first the heights of the heavens the sanctuary identified as the body of Christ and <clears throat> Why does 
содержит в себе возможности, дающие человеку способность быть оплодотворяемым семенем обетования, относящегося к преддверию нашей надежды, в плоде которого Бог получает основания вступить в битву за наши тела, чтобы разрушить державу смерти в нашем теле и с шумом навечно извергнуть ее из нашего тела. Кого? Весла человека, оружием которого и упованием является держава смерти, которая находится в нашем теле. То есть, конечно же, весный человек не заинтересован. Не заинтересован для того, чтобы мы слышали эту истину. Почему? Его больше всего пугает детского человека. Это церковь, в которой есть истина и есть Дух Святой. Церковь, где пребывает Бог, где люди познают Бога. Почему? Потому что победитель этого человека может только в плоде, в плоде, в характере Христовом, в Махусале. То есть это в плоде, которого Бог получает, в плоде которого Бог получает основание и изъедет детского человека. Поэтому он очень боится плода. Детский человек очень боится плода Духа, плод Духа. На иврите фраза «прибегать к Богу» означает, как глагол, это подходить к жертвеннику, приступать к познанию Бога, входить в святилище Бога, приближаться к Богу, прибегать к помощи Бога, находить себя в прибежище Бога, быть оплодотворяемым семьем Царства Небесного, взращивать плод Богу. А посему всякий раз, когда Бог посредством Святого Духа позволяет человеку прибегать или приступать к Нему, то в результате такой близости мы всегда будем иметь соответствующий плод в той сфере, в которой мы прибегаем к Богу. В результате такой близости к Богу мы всегда будем иметь соответствующий плод. То есть церкви, у которых нет... And so the church where God abides, and God abides in the church where God's order is, where there's the Urim and Thurim, and Thummim, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, the Thummim, it will allow people to change, and we need to determine these things by also looking at other the other components of what happens in the churches. And so the things that people used to stumble upon don't stumble anymore because people change, people transform, people renew their mind and are able to receive the truth. And so again, to run to God or approach God is to approach the altar, commence to know God, enter the sanctuary of God, get closer to God, resort to God's help, find yourself in the fortress of God, be fertilized with the seeds of the kingdom of heaven, and grow fruit to God. And so people try to make you afraid, people try to scare you with different things. When you uh, read statistics of how many Slavic people, brothers, our brothers, are, are, are dying, You feel as if uh, you're on a different planet. We love one another. And you see these terrible things. But we have peace and quiet because God abides in this place. We do uh, feel, we do sense the hits against the ark. <clears throat> Therefore, every time God, by the means of the Holy Spirit, allows man to run to or approach him, then the result of such contact always yields a corresponding fruit in the area in which to approach him. Considering this, as with the previous names of God, we need to note that the presence of the fortress of God in one area of life <clears throat> is not an, an automatic guarantee that it is present in the given name in another area, since according to the statements of Scripture, for the presence of the fortress of God, every individual area of life needs to be brought to proper condition. Therefore, it is specifically us and every individual area of our essence who are responsible for creating such an atmosphere which would be able to provide God with the legitimate ability to be our fortress. And such an atmosphere called to provide God with the legitimate ability to be our fortress is the good soil of our heart, able to receive the seed of the Word of God and grow fruit corresponding to the nature of the seed we have received. The atmosphere where we are ready to receive into our heart the seed of the Word of God so that it can grow fruit. 
so that we can grow fruit. This is the atmosphere where the Lord can be our fortress when we run to Him. When He met with Mary, Mary prepared her heart to meet with the Lord. What did Mary say? Your servant is here. May it be according to your word. She told him who she is <clears throat> and she acknowledged who she's speaking with. And so she showed God her status as his servant and she received his word. And she conceived in that moment. And she bore later, of course, as we know, the Son of God. She prepared the atmosphere for God so that God would become her fortress. And she became pregnant with the seed of promise and we then received Jesus Christ. And so for us to produce our fruit, we need to receive the Word of God. And to receive the Word of God, we need to be able to create a proper atmosphere for this Word, for the seed to be able to be planted. So you may say the Lord to the Lord may, may be according to your Word. And for this purpose, just as we studied the previous names of God called to be individual lots of our salvation, we need to study the following series of questions. What characteristics and categories identify our inherited lot contained in the name of God Fortress? What purpose is our inherited lot contained in the name of God Fortress called to fulfill in realizing our salvation? What price is required to be paid so that we can give God the ability to be our fortress? And by what results do we determine that God is truly our fortress in the realization of our calling? And today we will be looking at question four. By what results can we determine that God is truly our fortress in the realization of our calling consisting of adopting our body by the redemption of Christ to make us carriers of the heavenly body? And so our calling is to adopt our body by the redemption of Christ so that we could be carriers of the heavenly body. And let us look at six results. And we will examine ourselves as to whether we have these signs in our life, these results. Of course, there are areas we will f we will see that we have them. There will be areas that we will realize we need a little bit more work in. And that is for that purpose so that we can work on those areas. And so first result, that our heart is a fortress of God and that we are within the fortress of God is known in our contentment with what God has allowed us to have. Hebrews 13, 5 to 6. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. <clears throat> For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord himself said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. We are within the fortress and God is our fortress. He will not forsake us or leave us. And why? If we have conduct that's without covetousness and have the ability to be content with what we have, the phrase, let your conduct be without covetousness, the verb let your is taken from the military lexicon as it possesses a commanding form, making these words a commandment. Let your conduct be without covetousness. It's not just a an alternative or a recommendation. This is a command that God has given. We need to have a, con a conduct, form of conduct without covetousness. What is conduct without covetousness? So that we have it. It, first of all, is demonstrating godliness and content with what God has allowed us to have. Conduct without covetousness is power or control over money. If one loves it, it is then the root of all evil being supported by the demonic prince Mammon. 
1 Timothy 6, 6 through 11. Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 11. And so this is conduct without covetousness. This is demonstrating godliness and being content with what God has given you and demonstrate before God your ability to have control over your money, have authority over your money. <clears throat> and this comes from being content with what you have. And we talked about when uh, we were we were we had the service of tithes and offerings we talked about uh, we talked we talked about how God has as if it were a document that he's tracking and this is and this document tells him who he's working with who he's dealing with and And it's a good example, as in chemistry, where people test and and try different things out as to how uh, inks work and things like that within within the paper. And these specific uh, things will show him whether we have this covetousness or greed or whether we have authority and control over our own money. And so all of us... Uh, people, even especially the Im- immigrants, uh, we were literally thrown out of the place where we came, where we came from, and we we were forced out because we loved Christ. And people today uh, desire to to or wish that they maybe didn't come or maybe want to go back or want to go defend the countries. But unfortunately, you need to remember the fact that there, the people at that time tried to kill us. That's why we would. That's why a lot of us immigrated here. They persecuted us and hated us and kill and killed us. And so we were tested with this poverty, and we were content. We had bread and water. Today, people come from there and immediately ask, where's my new house, where's my new car? Because they receive this information, unfortunately, before they get here, information that's not accurate. But there is an ample amount of blessings and goodness here, obviously, that we have. And a lot of us started with nothing. And we were content. And also when the Lord gives you much, the Lord wants you to demonstrate faithfulness to Him. And regardless of the fact that you have this much, uh, you honor Him according to His commandments. And you need to be able to demonstrate before God that however God will either bless you with abundance or whether He'll test you with poverty, regardless you will honor him with his tith- with your tithes and offerings you will honor him according to his commandments because you t- you t- you testify before him that he is your god and you are his servant also conduct without covetousness is testimony that the root of all evil is uprooted from the soil of our heart and conduct without covetousness is testimony of generosity demonstrated in in an absence of vile and shameful greed 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, 
and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. The Lord had promised to make us rich with His grace, so that we being content, we would be ready for every good work. This is what it means to have conduct without covetousness. And the Lord says, if you have this kind of conduct, then He had vowed and promised that He will not abandon you, He will not leave you, He will be your fortress. This is the first result and sign. If you're asked, well, show me the sign that the Lord is your fortress. I have a conduct that is not full of covetousness or greed, and the Lord has promised that He will not abandon me or forsake me. Second result, that our heart is a fortress for God, and that we are within the within the fortress of God will be seen in our walk in the faith of God. Daniel 3.17.18 And so the three young boys, uh, if you remember during the time of Nebuchadnezzar with Daniel, who um, he wanted to kill them, and they told him what? They told Nebuchadnezzar what? Our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And so this golden image is prosperity. In other words, we will not serve your gods and we will not bow down to the idol, the image that you have set up. They demonstrated here (coughs) before King Nebuchadnezzar. They demonstrated the fact that God is their fortress, that God is able to deliver them from the fiery furnace and also from the hands of this king. And they said, even if it does not occur, even if we do burn, know that God is our fortress. That means we'll meet him sooner but we will not bow down to you. And so the fortress of God is in our walking in His faith. And so walking in in the faith of God, what does it mean? If someone asks, what does it mean to walk in the faith of God? First, walking in the faith of God is testimony that our heart is a fortress of God. And so God finds His fortress and his comfort in our heart and the other side of the coin walking in the faith of God is testimony that the word of God is our fortress and so I place myself into God's word and when I place myself into his word and the word of God is a fortress for me then my heart becomes a fortress for him he is very comfortable in that heart that finds their fortress in his word and so why are we looking at the word we read these words the preached word that is given to us and it was given to her to be clothed in fine and bright linen as it's written we have been given this truth so that we can be clothed into this truth and so walking in faith I walk in faith you walk in faith we walk in faith when the Word of God is our fortress. We submerge ourselves into the Word, and this allows God to then find His fortress in our heart. This atmosphere of the Word of God that's in our heart, this is that atmosphere where the Lord desires to find His peace and His rest. And so if you remember that the Lord would meet with Adam in the cool of the day, this is the comfort, a comfortable time that He felt, and This is what he will sense and feel in our own heart when we have his word in our heart to worship and we worship him in spirit and in truth. And so you know that this person can speak with God, have all the gifts, have all kinds of different Uh, good things as it would appear but unfortunately still serve from the carnal flesh and not serve from the spirit and when you don't serve with the spirit that means you are not an Eden for God 
We need to keep our heart with all diligence as it is written in scripture. And the devil knows that if he entered that Eden, he can enter this Eden just the same way. And he does it successfully when he begins to question the word that we receive. He did what? He began to question God. The devil begins to cast shadows upon God. Our spirit does not communicate with the devil, but our mind can pay attention if it if you if a person chooses. Did Pastor Arkady say this or mean this? Do you really think that you could trust him? What do you think about this place of scripture? What, what would you what how would you interpret it? These kinds of things that he brings to our mind. And so from the day, you know very confidently that in the day that the Lord sent this apostle into your life, you knew that he was from God and that he's, pro- he's giving you the word of God, the truth. And now all fantasies no longer are relevant or ideas that we may have other than the truth when it comes to the interpretation. And so, the element of walking in the faith of God, demonstrating the fact that our heart is a fortress of God and the Word of God is our fortress, will be the ability to have favorable risk or take favorable risks. When a person walks in God's faith, one of the qualities that of or one of the qualities of walking in the faith of God is uh, favorable risks. Not the kind of risks where the devil told the Jesus, cast yourself down, for he has commanded his angels. This, he, he wanted him to risk it and to jump. This isn't the risk it's referring to. This is a, a suicidal a, a act. And so the risk is taking the proper actions, pro- taking the proper steps to be able to put your soul to death. <clears throat> your old man. First Thessalonians 2, 2 through 4. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, a God who tests our heart. And so here Apostle Paul speaks of the great risk. This is that the steps you take, the decision you make. And so this risk is 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 the risk, the steps you take to be able to <clears throat> put your soul to death. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me, neither eat or drink for three days, or th- nor, three, nor three days, night or day, my maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Esther 4, 15 through 16. Also risk, but this is a step she's taking, a righteous, righteous act that she's, uh, she's doing. And this is what is referred to as a favorable risk. Favorable but in the eyes of the Heavenly Father. The next element of walking in the faith of God, demonstrating the fact that our heart is a fortress of God and the Word of God is our fortress, will be expressed in our ability to remain faithful to God in the unknown. Hebrews 11.8 By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Hebrews 11, 8, he continued to stay faithful to the word that God had spoken to him, and he went not knowing where he was going, but the Lord told him to go. We're talking about how we can walk in faith. 
will demonstrate faithfulness in the unknown. Acts 20, 22. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. This is Apostle Paul. He, for the sake of the church, uh, took uh, and made decisions to take specific risks. Job also talked about uh, taking risks, and he said, I know my Redeemer lives, and he will in the last day. will see my body be restored before me and healed before me. And so this is also an example of continuing to be faithful to God in the unknown because for a sufficiently long time he was uh, leprous and sick and he continued to hear uh, condemnation in his direction for a, for, for a long time. Sometimes you want answers to specific questions. But you say, Lord, how do I determine if I'm walking in the faith? If someone asks you, how, what does it mean to walk in the faith? You can say, first, this is a favorable risk when we can uh, <clears throat> make a favorable decisions in the eyes of God. Second is, when you're in the unknown, you still remain faithful to Him. The next element of walking in the faith of God, demonstrating the fact that our heart is a fortress of God and the Word of God is our fortress, is expressed in our ability to differentiate the voice of God within our spirit from other voices and follow the voice of God. And so you may say, well, I haven't really made any bold steps or any any steps, uh, risky steps, but for God's sake, you may... And so how how do I determine that I'm actually walking? It's easy. You will be able to differentiate the voice of God within your spirit from other voices. And so we hear the voice of the pastor, John 10, 2 through 5. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he was brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. John 10, 2 through 5. And so don't follow a voice you don't know or listen to it, but instead one you do know and that you are familiar with according to the truth that they speak. And so sheep are thoughts that we tend. Others tend pigs, but we're talking about people who walk in the faith. And so walking in the faith is not to tend pigs, but to tend sheep, flocks. And he, the Lord, comes into our spirit you need the Holy Spirit to be able to reveal you the truth in your heart. And so the Holy Spirit uh, reveals the, the preached word. And when he expl- he reveals and then explains the, uh, the preached word. And so if a pa- our Pastor Arkady would be sitting up there, up here right now, then this would be the the el- the the fresh word that we would be hearing that we need to accept and put into our heart and then this shepherd needs to lead them out into the resurrection of Christ that's what we're doing today we're leading these out into pastures so that we we chew this truth and and these revelations and so the pastor and and the Holy Spirit work with us to uh, when we're meditating upon the Word of God we meditate about it then we have <clears throat> the Holy Spirit who helps us and reveals the meaning of these things and works with us. That means we're walking in the faith. When a person has uh, a negative thing in their head or a filthy thing or a, an, uh, any kind of thing that may not be clean, uh, then of course you work on these things so that you clean them out so that you could uh, tend than just flocks, the flocks of the Lord, instead of other things. 
David, he tended the flocks of his father, Jesse. Moses also, he tended the flocks of his father-in-law, Jethro. And so all of these messengers of God, men of God, they tended flocks of others. And to tend these flocks, it's necessary that this shepherd be in our heart because of the preached word. The next element of walking in the faith of God, demonstrating the fact that our heart is a fortress of God and the word of God is our fortress, will be expressed in our ability to produce the fruit of the Spirit. It's necessary to change. This means that we walk in the faith. And so it's not enough just to take uh, favorable risks or to walk in the unknown and remain faithful. And also that our thoughts would be going to our heart and coming back out again up and down the circulation continue in our in ourselves but it's also necessary to produce produce fruit that means uh, ch- we need to change but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it this is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred sixty or thirty times what was sown Matthew thirteen twenty three. The good soil of the heart is identified as walking in the faith of God. At the same time, the bad soil of the heart identifies walking in the flesh. Galatians 5, 19 through 23. Here we could see what it means to walk in the flesh and and, and what it means to walk in in the spirit. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of, of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, such things there is no law. Galatians 5, 19 through 23. And so now let's turn to the third result. The third result, that our heart is a fortress of God and that we are within the fortress of God will be seen in our abiding in a, in the cov- or in a covenant with God. And it's, it will be known in our ability to cleanse the aspects of our life that we carry responsibility for before God from idols. So God is my fortress and He... And so God is our fortress and we are in His fortress and this is demonstrated by the fact that we cleanse all aspects of our life that we, ca- we carry responsibility for. We cleanse them from idols. Let's read about Josiah. Second Chronicles 34, 1-3. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. An eight-year-old boy, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. In the eighth year of his reign, he was 16 years old. While he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. In his twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, Asherah poles and idols. And so he came to the God of his father Jacob. He began to seek him. A result of the fact that God is our fortress, we need to be like Josiah. The Holy Spirit telling us the deeds which the descendant of David Josiah did during his reign of 31 years and was able to summarize the essence of his works in only a few sentences. But even these few sentences uh, gave uh, an abundance of information. First, we need to pay attention to the number eight. The number eight that it's written about here is a symbol of the covenant, which man makes with God upon his conditions. And specifically, being and abiding in a covenant with God makes the heart of a person a fortress of God and gives this person the legitimate ability to approach God. And so Josiah was eight eight years old, and <clears throat> when he began to reign, and 
eight years after that, he began to follow after the God of his father, David. <clears throat> At the same time, a covenant with God, which makes itself known in the number 12, indicates the order of God and the rule of God and the fruit of our spirit in the form of the male child. And so we need to have these qualities of Josiah and we need to have them present within us uh, so that we can achieve this number 12 when the Lord begins to cleanse our Judah from high places and from idols. For this, it is necessary to understand this number 8 and the essence of this number. And we, we find the number 8 three times in the story of Josiah. <clears throat> and so as every uh, Jewish boy they were first circumcised in the eighth day after their birth and so what is the number 12 number 12 is when we when he began to cleanse all Judah from the idols and the high places and we need to show before God that I have a covenant with you and he says, okay, now show me the three eights. First eight is that Josiah was circumcised in the eighth day. This is a symbol of the covenant of blood indicating justification, which we receive freely by grace in the redemption of Jesus Christ in the format of a guarantee. Genesis 17, 12 through 14. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised including those born in your household or brought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring, whether born in your household or brought or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your, in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. And uncircumcised, any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the, fle- in the flesh will be cut off from my people. He has broken my covenant. And so here it's referring to a eight-year-old boy who makes a covenant with God in the baptism of water. And so God gives the command that every male child will be circumcised, otherwise he'll be cut off from the people. And so in this baptism of water, the Lord shows us his mystery, where he begins to imprint the faith of our heart upon our heart, uh, imprint this truth, the covenant. And so the covenant of blood and peace that we make with God, this was the first eight. The second eight, Josiah became king when he was eight years old. An eight-year-old boy began to rule the kingdom. This is a symbol of the covenant of salt, indicating the ability of the re- reasonable abilities of man to rule over the emotional aspect of their soul. Mary, she was a virgin, and she matured, and back then the people matured a little bit sooner. We're not talking about the age where she became pregnant, but the age where she said, and so at such a young age, you just see this hero of faith and the incredible teaching that she had in herself that the angel was able to speak to her about the scriptures, the word of God, and she perfectly understood what he was saying. We ha- and so people uh, in Pentecostal services, Baptist services, uh, <clears throat> that are much older have difficulty doing these things but this young girl young woman was able to do this and so again we're seeing here that when he was eight years old he began to rule this is the covenant of salt and in the covenant of salt this is the baptism of the holy spirit and so this is the age when he was eight years old that he was baptized in the Holy Spirit 
ним. И потом уже позже, когда он уже проснулся, сказали ему, он не видел, пока не замолился. Это о что? Вот это 8 лет, это... And so... Everything that we're talking about here, the number eight and all of these examples, we're looking at all of this spiritually. We're not talking about physically being eight years old, but we're talking about in the spirit. And third, that third eight that we find, Josiah, after eight years of his reign upon the throne of David, his father, began to run to the God of David, his father. This symbolizes abiding in the covenant of peace, indicating the fact that our heart has become a fortress for God which has given God the legitimate ability to become our fortress. And so, eight years of his reign, after eight years of his reign, he began to go to <coughs> the God of his father, David. <coughs> By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had, he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he, re he rested from all his works. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because... On it, he rested from all the works, creating, rested from all the works of creating what he had done. Genesis 2, 2 through 3. And so he approached God. He ran to the God of his father, Jacob, so that he can get advice of how to properly behave. <coughs> And so right now, what are we doing? We're reading right now the writings of our pastor. And we are having fellowship with God. The Lord is having fellowship with our hearts. When we're lo looking at this word, we're learning this word, and he's communicating with us. The fact that we run to our the God of our father David, that means we're already on our way to the baptism of fire. And so, Josiah abiding in a unique covenant with God in all three of its purposes allowed him in the in the 12th year of his reign to bring all of the areas he was responsible for into the proper order of God. And so the covenant of peace, covenant of blood, covenant of salt, they allowed him to utilize the authority God gave him so that he can bring order within the kingdom. This was the third result. Now, fourth result, that our heart is a fortress for God and that we are within the fortress of God. And it will be manifested in our ability to look upon our enemies. Psalm 118.7 The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. Psalm 118.7 and so you say, well, why do you need to look at them? And so you could tell uh, in a person, of course, if, if, he's, if there's power in a person and, or if a person is avoiding you or avoiding your eyes, whether it be a friend or an enemy, but what does it mean? to look at your enemies. In Hebrew, the phrase, I look in triumph on my enemies, means I will calmly look at my enemies. I will look over my enemies. I will recognize my enemies. I will understand the strategy of my enemies. I will allow myself to be seen by my enemies. I will resist my enemies. I will trample upon my enemies. And so that we understand their strategy, that we confront them and resist them within our essence. And so when you're talking about lo looking, there's, a, it's, there's importance in this. Look what the serpent did. He told Eve, just look, look at the fruit. And she saw, and she saw that it was uh, pleasant and good uh, to eat. And so this demonstrates a specific position when she looked because she listened to him and she did what he asked uh, once she he was successful in this and so to look upon the enemies of god the lawless the wicked and our old self this is to have the right position in god and 
the Word of God. And so it's important to look and how to look. And so there's a habit in some cultures, some nationalities, as it was during the Soviet Union times, people looked at each other and stared at each other. It was a norm to do these things. People had a habit of doing this. But in other places that I lived, uh, if you're staring at a person or a man is staring at another man, you literally are calling him out. That was typically the the uh, the meaning of that. If if a person did this, another will understand this as you're calling him out and trying to confront him with something. In scripture, when you're looking at your enemies, however, you need to look at them because we're ready to fight. We're ready to battle with this person. With, with with our person or with any enemy that it may be. However, to look upon your enemies with the eyes of God as your helper, it is necessary to provide God with legitimate grounds to be our helper. This is because God promised to be our helper exclusively upon the conditions that are contained in the covenant which he has made with us. In Hebrew, the word helper, who God has promised to be for man upon his conditions, means a helper is one who stands for you, who stands with you, and who stands also against you if you violate God's commandments. He stands for you and with you and will stand against you. This is the kind of helper. And so when you, we look at our enemies, the scriptures say, don't forget, God is a helper, but he doesn't play at games. And so if you remember, that in the story of the Israelites, there was a moment where they decided they would go as they did before, rise and go and fight the Philistines. Unfortunately, they didn't realize God had stepped away from them and they had a terrible situation that occurred at that time because they didn't consult with God first. If we abide in a covenant with God, fulfilling our role upon the conditions of the covenant we made with God, we provide God with the legitimate grounds upon which to fulfill His role, to stand for us and stand with us against our enemies in the form of governing sin within our body. We abide in the covenant. That means God is for us, He stands for us and with us. But if we do not fulfill our role in the covenant we made with God, consisting of seeking the kingdom of God within our heart, in the righteousness of God, God then, instead of being our helper, will convert into our enemy. And if we resist him, it is death-like. Psalm 10:13-18. Why does the wicked man revile God? And so David says, why does the wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, he won't call call me to account? But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked of, of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for his wickedness. That, that would not otherwise be found out. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his land. The Lord hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed, so that mere earthly mortals will never again strike terror. <clears throat> and so David says, you see that, uh, you see the oppression, what the old man uh, does to our soul. And our eyes see these things too when we are in a covenant with God. The Lord looks through our eyes upon our enemies. When we make a covenant with Him, the Lord, no, the Lord now looks at our enemies through our own eyes. It's necessary to abide in a covenant with God so that the Lord looked through our eyes. Sometimes meeting with saints, uh, there's been situations where you see Christ. Even in our church, you'll be able to see Christ in the eyes of, of brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. 
And so we're talking specifically about how the Lord looks at his servants and how he, looking through the eyes of his servants, looks at the looks at his enemies. First sign that we abide within a covenant with God is the readiness or preparedness of our hearts so that Gentiles in the form of our corrupt desires would disappear from the boundaries of our body. Second sign that we abide in a covenant with God will be our ability to defend the fatherless and oppressed in the form of our soul, which has died for her nation, the house of her father, and for her corrupt desires. And so these two things determine that we are in a covenant with God. Our soul is in the form of one who is fatherless and oppressed. And we look through the eyes of God so that these the wicked disappear from within our body. Therefore, to look upon your enemies with the eyes of God means to see with your with the eyes of your heart when the banner rises upon the mountains and the and listen when the trumpet of the Lord sounds in the preached word of the person clothed into the authority of a father of God. Let's read it one more time, very beautifully stated. How do you learn to look at your enemies through the eyes of God? And so how do you learn at your enemies? How do you lo- learn to look at your enemies through the eyes of God? And so how do you look at them through the eyes of God? How do you learn to do this? How do I determine that I'm in the covenant? And so that God can look through my eyes upon my enemies. It's necessary to look with your eyes, the eyes of your heart, when the banner will rise upon the mountains of promise and listen when the trumpet sounds. And so when we see the banner of the promises of God rises and when we hear the sound of the trumpet, that means we have the ability to look upon our enemies with God's eyes or God, more accurately, God will look at our enemies using our eyes when we see the banner upon the mountains, these are the uh, the promises and the sound of the trumpet. Isaiah 18, 3 through 4. All people of the world, you who live on the earth, when a banner is raised on the mountains, and you will see it, and when a trumpet sounds, you will hear it. This is what the Lord says to me. I will remain quiet and will look on look on from my dwelling place, like shimmering heat in the sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. <clears throat> and so first he says, when you live on earth, you... When the banners are raised on the mountains and you see these banners are raised upon the mountains, you will see it. And when a trumpet sounds, you will hear it. This is what the Lord says to me. I will remain quiet and will look on from my dwelling place like shimmering heat in the sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. And so what does it mean to see the banner that rises upon the mountains and to hear the sound of the trumpet? These two things that allow God to look through our eyes upon our enemies so that they be afraid because the old man uh, you can try to yell at him you can try to but when the Lord looks through our eyes upon him he will understand things immediately and the old man will understand that you have seen the banner rising on the mountains and you will and that you have heard the trumpet sounding and to so to see the banner raised on the mountains means to understand the signs of the times and when the promises are to be fulfilled the promise of the adoption of our body by the redemption of Christ where we are called to then to carry the heavenly body before the son of righteousness the rising son of righteousness to know the signs of the times and to see the fulfillment of God's promise to see the sign, this is the banner, these are God's promises, and so upon our the promises we need to see this banner that rises. But before this can happen you need to form these mountains, these te- tectonics, and everything else that needs to rise within us. In our heart we don't have mountains. 
it's necessary that all of these uh, t- tectonic plates move and begin to rise, uh, lift up and create mountains within our heart. We die for our personal desires. Uh, this this shows then the creation of the mountains. And then upon these mountains, you'll be able to see this banner of God's promises. And this banner is the adoption of our body by the redemption of Christ. And we hear this promise today. That means upon our mountains, <clears throat> this banner has been lifted. Malachi 4, 1 through 3. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, Malachi 4, 1 through 3. And the Lord will do this when we will abide in His covenant. And to abide in His covenant means to see the banner that is lifted upon the mountain of promise. And when you see this banner, that means our commander has lifted this banner. We, together with him, can uh, shout aloud and go out to battle. Today, commanders, of course, they they command from the White House or other places. Uh, But, and they use buttons and they use uh, other uh, technological ways of doing this, but but the way it works with the Lord is that it is on the stage or from the stage in the church. And so, of course, when I'm reiterating the words of pastor, I always need to be careful as well. And so the next is to hear the sound of the trumpet. To hear the sound of the trumpet means to obey the vo- the voice of the trumpet. That is the voice of the person who is clothed into a, the authority of a father. He is a loud trumpet for those who can hear it and who receive his word. And so when you're asked what does it mean to hear the sound of the trumpet on the mountains, this means obey the voice of the trumpet. That is the person whom God has sent into my life to hear the voice of the trumpet. And this is something that that one can hear if he is obedient to the word of God. If a person is not obedient to the word of God, he can't hear the sound of the trumpet or listen to it. And so you need to be ready that of course, when you go to listen to the word of God and you say, Lord, maybe it's not going to be a comforting word. It may be it's a, cor- a word of correction today, but I'm ready to receive it and ready to accept it if that's the case. You see this banner being lifted upon the mountains to know the sign of the times and the fulfillment of God's promise and hear the sound of the trumpet that is obey the voice of the trumpet. <clears throat> if we can look at our enemies calmly, That means that we, our heart, is a fortress for God, and God, in turn, is our fortress. <laughs> Fifth result, that our heart is a fortress of God, and that we are within the fortress of God, will be evidence of our origination from the seed of Jacob. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord, <clears throat> whose, whose hope is in the Lord, their God, Psalm 146, 5. <clears throat> and so if we can't call our God the God of Jacob, then the Lord can't be our fortress. If we don't have evidence that we originate from the seed of Jacob, the God of Jacob cannot be then our helper and our hope. Therefore, our heart will not be able to be a fortress for God, and furthermore, God will not be able to then be our fortress. <clears throat> Romans 9, 6 through 8. For not all who are descendant from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac 
that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by the physical descent who are God's children, but it is in the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. Romans 9, 6 through 8. We ask the question, by what signs can you determine your origination from Jacob? The sign by which you can determine your origination from Jacob is the promise in the fruit of righteousness that is grown in the good soil of our heart, which will then be the adoption of our body by the redemption of Christ. And so originating from Jacob demonstrates, demonstrates itself in the fruit of righteousness. In Jacob, the Lord had said to Abraham, it is not those that are physical children, but children according to the promise that have the fruit of righteousness. And so these promises, these are our children, and this is the fruit of righteousness. And so our children, again, are our promise, and our promise promises are the fruit in the fruit of righteousness. And so the promises we're waiting for, they need to be uh, in the form of fruit, in the form of children. Justification is the seed, but fruit... <laughs> is the fruit of righteousness. It's what the seed uh, grows. The character of Christ, Methuselah. Yeah. So let's look at Jacob a little bit about his life. Genesis 20, 10 through 15. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped from the for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angel of God, w- angels of God were des- ascending and descending on it. There above it, above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which, on which you are lying. Your descendants will like be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I will, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Genesis 20, 10 through 15. As you know, Esau, he represents our soul and governing sin in our soul. And he was an enemy, of course, as we know of Jacob. And Haran is where the Lord makes a covenant, an important place. And upon this place, he saw a ladder, the ladder that Jacob saw in Haran, upon which angels were ascending and descending, is a covenant given to man. And upon this co- this ladder, collaborating with the, is the collaboration of the role of God with the role of man. The angels were uh, ascending and descending. This is a collaboration of our faith with the faith of God. My role and God's role collaborating. And so they were ascending and descending, the collaborative work, the role of God and the role of man. And so we have this ladder, and we know the role of God, and we know our own role. You need to know the role, your own role, and you have to know the role of God. And so we need to study what God's role is, what our role is, so that we can have this ladder. Without this knowledge, we don't have this ladder. The promise of the land given to Jacob is a symbol of the heavenly body, which is called to inherit, that our descendants are to inherit. This represents the fruits of righteousness and all those things that flow from that for the goodness of God. God wanted our body to become a heavenly body. But before this body becomes heavenly, our body needs to be delivered from the old man who will be thrusted out and thrown into hell. And after that, he will make this body a heavenly body when it will be taken to heaven. And so why do we need this heavenly body, this promised land? The land of Canaan, the land of Israel. The reason for it is so that we have our descendants and these are fruits of righteousness grown in our heart. This is for whom the Lord has prepared this land. And so our land, our body, 
what kind of descendants will it have? Fruits of righteousness, the character of Christ, all of these promises, all of our children, fruits of righteousness, they need to live upon the promised land, not upon the Canaanite land, but upon the Israelite land. The role of Jacob in collaboration with the inheritance of Abraham and Isaac and also the inheritance that he received all of this resulted in him giving God a tenth part of everything he had Genesis 20 16 through 22 when Jacob awoke from sleep he thought surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it he was afraid and said how awesome is this place this is none other than the house of God this is the gate of heaven Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am talk- I am taking and I will give, and he will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household. Then the Lord will be my God, and the stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Genesis 28, 16 through 22. If in our heart we have this covenant that we made, and it's in the form of this ladder of Jacob that he saw, and where we see clearly uh, the imprinted promises linked to the adoption of our body by the redemption of Christ, then this means that we have evidence that we originate from Jacob. Jacob said, if you will give me bread and clothes to wear and you allow me to return to my father's house, I will give you a tenth part of everything. I will establish the promises that you've given me. Tithes and offerings we give to God, we honor him. We also confirm something within our lives. And so let us now be blessed in our prayers. We will pray and thank God for the word that we were able to receive today. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. Your, your family, your body, for the ability to submerge into your word. We thank you that upon your heights we see the rising banner. We thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us today to hear the sound of your trumpet. And we pray today, Lord, that you look through the eyes of our heart upon our enemies. That fill maybe even the promised land that you have given. We thank you for this promise that you've given, the the salvation of our spirit, the salvation of our mortal body, a mortal soul, and the adoption of our corrupt body. I pray that you with noise would be able to thrust out the old man, the stronghold of death from within our body, and upon its place erect the stronghold of life and resurrection in the form of the new person. And so first allow us to allow you to look upon all of our enemies through our eyes, the eyes of our heart, so that we can bring fear upon them, upon our enemies. You said, Lord, that before you take your church and before you give her the bright and morning star, you said that we will tend, we will rule the Gentiles with a rod of iron. They will be crushed as a clay pot. And we pray that you give today this authority, and we thank you for this authority, that we are able to not just look Oh, and allow you to look through our eyes upon our enemies, but get the, through the confessions of the faith of our heart, walking in faith with your iron rod to be able to crush all your enemies within ourselves, within our essence. We pray, Lord, that you show your mercy for our body, and we thank you for the adoption of our bodies. We also pray for your church, that you show your mercy, and that we according to your word, we'll be able to then look at all of our enemies. We pray that all of your enemies all over the face of the world that fill the Church of Christ would be gathered and bundled up 
and cast and removed so to be prepared for fire so that your inheritance would be able to sit in your kingdom and wait for your coming in your glory we thank you Lord for the truth that you've given us today thank you that you've given us the ability to be clothed in fine and bright linen thank you that you has, have given to us today these revelations through our pastor who serves you in the spirit and the preached word we pray for his health and his restoration we believe that you have your own time frames and that time is within your authority we only pray for your mercy that your mercy show and be favorable to him to our pastor to our dear pastor and our leader so that the words that he has to to still tell us and to pass on to us to give to us uh, we are ready to receive them and we see these banners even risen today upon the mountains and they were risen these banners in our heart we received the ability to hear the sound of your trumpet the voice of your trumpet and we pray that you continue to knock upon our heart with your revelations and we open our hearts because every area of our life is with is absolutely ready to without any deviation to fulfill everything that you say <clears throat> and that you tell us in your truth thank you that we can live <clears throat> that we can walk in your faith and thank you for the acts of faith the act, risk uh, <clears throat> the risks that we will take we die for a nation the house of our father and our corrupt desires we together with Christ and in Christ we can and look at the acts and our steps that we've made and this has clothed us into the status of strangers fatherless and widows and you pay attention to them and you are a fortress for them thank you Lord that you are our fortress that your word and the Holy Spirit that reveals the meaning of this word is our fortress <clears throat> we thank you, Lord, for the truth that we were able to hear today. We thank you, Lord, that we had the opportunity to bring out the flock of your sheep to pasture, to meditate, allow us to be clothed into this truth. And we pray, Lord, that the power of your anointed word and the Holy Spirit would be able to be demonstrated in the confessions of our mouth and that all of our enemies would be crushed before your face in our essence and so Lord today we look at our enemies we do not turn away our eyes we look at them because we believe that you are our helper and we are within your covenant we we thank you for your covenant the covenant of blood covenant of peace and covenant of rest and so the confessions of the faith of our heart and the covenant of salt so that you with noise would be able to thrust out the stronghold of death in the form of illnesses and poverty untimely death all fears phobias binding sins ignorance arrogance all of this would be destroyed before your holy face you Lord when you appear with your saints who will come with you upon white horses you will destroy the Antichrist and his false prophet with the sword of your mouth but we pray Lord before you appear for your saints you will be glorified in them and you will demonstrate your victory within that very wonderful anointed word and so we pray for the word that is now in our hearts so that it can strike and destroy the wicked one the old man together with the false prophet the uncircumcised mind that has not passed through the process of death and gives power to the Antichrist, the old man, so that they together be thrusted out 
into hell. We thank you, Lord, for our born spirit, for our renewed soul, and our body, which today we confess as adopted from death and corruption. We pray that this carnal would be swallowed up by victory and that death be swallowed up with immortality. May your holy name be blessed. We worship before you and before your word. And we will with trembling wait for the words that you will be giving to us and allow us to have on Sunday. We thank you, Lord, for the church. We thank you for Zion. We thank you that we are united with Zion and with your truth and that your truth so that it be received the ability to produce fruit within our spirit. May your name be blessed and glorified a great God, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen let's finish with our manifestation now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever Amen